then let me say just a few words more about fixed points and differential equations. Um, I guess more than anything, I want to introduce bifurcations. And when I say introduce, I do mean introduce. There are entire textbooks on bifurcation theory. People like do their doctorates looking at bifurcations. We're going to talk about this for five to 10 minutes, and then it will never come up again in this class, but at least we'll have touched on it. So a differential equation will usually have parameters. So in optimization models, you've got birth rates and death rates and the like. Um, sometimes, Usually, now let me say, usually small changes in the parameters have small have is probably not quite the word result in small changes to the behavior that our model Predicts. This is very informally the concept of structural stability. And structural stability is a blessing. You could not do differential equations if this were not true. Um, I mean, because think of an animal population. You know, you've got your birth rate and your death rate, and you've got some other stuff if you're looking at the logistic model. And you know, you're not going to be able to state an animal population's birth rate accurate to the millionth decimal place. You'll be lucky if you're accurate to the first decimal place. You know, zoology and biology and all of these fields are messy and they don't lend themselves to getting these super exact parameters that we get in physics. Fortunately, it usually doesn't matter. If your parameters are off by a bit, your model will be off by a bit. Sometimes there is a parameter value such that the model behaves 
significantly differently if the parameter is less than that value versus if the parameter is greater than that value. And this value of the parameter, if it exists, is called a bifurcation value. And it might seem like having a bifurcation value is the opposite of being structurally stable. We don't really think of it in those terms. Usually when we're having bifurcation values, we're calling it a parameter, but we're really thinking of it as a variable. And let me give an example to show how this works and what I mean, because I know that what was written on the whiteboard was a little vague, very vague. Let's look at another population model. So this population model is going to look like a logistic model but we have that H term being subtracted from it. And this H term is a harvesting term. So we're looking at, for example, the fish population in a bay. And the fish are doing whatever they're doing. They're growing logistically towards a carrying capacity, except that we are fishing in the bay. So we are periodically removing fish from the population. So the logistic model with harvesting. Let me, yeah, it would be great if I could do this on Desmos. So let's see if I can. We are, don't need those. Let's say um, DPDT, I'm going to just call Y. So I'm writing y equals, but what we're going to see here is going to be the derivative, dp dt. Um, 20, let's see. x, it will have to be minus 50 x squared. Wait a minute. Wrong. No, nothing's wrong. Let me, this is exactly what I want to see. Let me zoom in on it. Uh, well, maybe 
and then minus h. And h is a parameter. Let's see. Okay. So here's the rate of change of the fish population when our harvesting is 9.4. And you notice that this derivative is always negative. And when the derivative is negative, the fish population is going down. So, this level of harvesting is going to cause extinction in the fish population. They're going to just keep decreasing and keep, keep decreasing until there are no fish left. So we should harvest less, presumably. And notice that as our harvesting decreases, this parabola is going up. When our harvesting decreases sufficiently, this parabola is just crushing the axis. So when our harvesting was too large, the derivative was always negative. There were no fixed points and the population is decreasing. We increase that harvesting value, we decrease that harvesting value. And now there's a point where the derivative is equal to zero. So suddenly, there's a fixed point. The derivative's zero somewhere. Well, the derivative's negative everywhere else, though. So the diagram looks like that. And this is an unstable fixed point, what we might call semi-stable. Um, in this situation, the fish are still would do. Um, and that's why it's not a good idea to think of semi-stable as being halfway between stable and unstable. The reason I say the fish are do is, I mean, let's say we start with a lot of fish. You know, there are rat, um, our population is going this way. But in the real world, there are random perturbations. Sometimes it will go up, sometimes it will go down. It's going basically this way. And then eventually, you know, it's really close to the fixed point. One of these random perturbations we talk about, there's a harsh winter and the population is driven below the fish point. And then it works its way down to extinction. Sometimes random noise might temporarily bump it back up but the model predicts that the fish will go extinct. Decrease harvesting even more though, and suddenly you're seeing something a lot more hopeful. You're seeing this. The derivative is now zero twice. So there are now two fixed points of the derivative. And let's look at those fixed points. Here's the derivative. Here are the fixed points where the derivative is zero. The derivative is positive here, negative here, negative here. 
Uh, when I say the derivatives positive here, negative here, negative here, what I'm literally doing is looking at the graph of the derivative. And I see it's above the axis here, below the axis here, below the axis here. And suddenly we have an asymptotically stable fixed point. And this is an oversimplification, but in general, asymptotically stable fixed points are the kinds of fixed points we can see in nature. So this is good. What we want to see in nature is that the fish population remains around the same and doesn't go extinct. And that's precisely what we have here with an asymptotically stable fixed point. So again, thinking that this in terms of harvesting, maybe, no, this is fine. No fixed points. 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 Come on, this mouse is not cooperating with me. Let's try again. No fixed points, none, none, none. Curse you. There we go. So for this value of H, or eight apparently, suddenly a fixed point appears. There weren't any fixed points before, but now suddenly there is one. And that fixed point is unstable. We decrease H more, and suddenly from having one fixed point, we have two fixed points. So changing H changes the number of fixed points we have from zero to one to two. And going back to what I wrote on the whiteboard, This is all based on whether or not H is less than eight or greater than eight. When it was greater than eight, there weren't any fixed points. When it was less than eight, there were fixed points. So eight is a bifurcation value. That was a pretty uh, quick and dirty presentation. As I said, I don't think, no, I don't, I don't have to think. I know that we're not going to be looking at bifurcations in this course, but it's such an important area of study that it would be kind of weird to present fixed points and not at least mention bifurcation. So, we have now done our duty in that department.